<laughs> now everybody from the 313, put your motherfucking hands up and follow me! Now, I'm repping Detroit today, because we're talking about not just one of Detroit's best cocktail creations from the Detroit Athletics Club, but what might be the most perfect cocktail on the face of the fucking planet, and you better believe we're responsible for that. The Detroit Athletics Club, and the last word on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Okay, so now before we begin, I'm gonna get out of this ridiculous getup, because it doesn't work for me in the slightest, and I'm not even actually from Detroit. I was born there, but I grew up in Livonia, so. Put that back on, okay, that feels better. So yeah, today we're talking about The Last Word, a cocktail that was invented at the Detroit Athletics Club in 1915. Now, The Last Word is an equal part sour containing gin, maraschino liqueur, green chartreuse, and lime juice. And those things come together in a really pungent, robust, sweet tart balance that is kind of undeniably one of the best things ever. So the drink comes into play around 1915 at the Detroit Athletics Club, and a lot of the historical writings for it claim that a gentleman by the name of Frank Fogarty came up with it. And uh, I think that that is complete bullshit. There's a couple of reasons why. First of all, the guy's not from Detroit, uh, and he's also not a bartender. <laughs> he's from New York, and he's a vaudeville actor who, I guess, is known for monologues. And apparently he went into politics at one point. He's not a mixologist. He's not even a bartender. And for some reason, his name gets attached to this drink because of the way it appears in cocktail books at the time. And there's no mention of who actually came up with it. For whatever reason, I just completely doubt that this vaudeville actor knew that these four things would go together so well in equal parts, and it just became a thing at the DAC. It doesn't make sense. Odds are this was most likely made by a person of color who worked at the DAC in 1915, and Frank Fogarty uh, made it popular in New York, something that is actually documented as having happened, and it just meant that Frank ended up catching all the fame for it, despite not having any role in actually coming up with it. Regardless of all of that, 1915 The Drink hits the menu on the DA at the DAC, and people fall in love with it. It is a pungent, robust, yet simple and elegant solution to a sour that does not use any syrups, but instead relies on liqueurs for its sweetness. Sort of like a daisy. Now, the, the thing is, the drink is super popular. It makes its way from Detroit to Chicago and New York, and from there it shows up on the West Coast and down in the South in Miami, Florida. It goes all over the place. It is extremely popular. And there is a book that I believe uh, comes out in 1951 by uh, something Saucier. I'll put a picture of him up here as well as a picture of the book. It gets published in this book and it's, probably from there that the Frank Fogarty information comes from, but it's so popular that it gets written down. It gets shared with the world and sort of immortalized, at least temporarily, which isn't really how that works. After the 1950s and its appearance in Saucier's cocktail book, it kind of disappears for a while. The cocktail dark ages that we've talked about a couple previous times, like in the Mind Eraser Replacer episodes, though those times kind of eradicate the subtle balance and complicated aromatics of the last word and it just disappears for some time. Then in the early 2000s, I believe 2005 and 2000, or 2006, one of those two, uh, a cocktail uh, bartender from Seattle, whose name I can't remember, but I will put them up here on the screen, I promise you that. Um, they discover a copy of Saucier's book, they find the last word in it, they put it on the menu, the regulars at the bar love it, and they end up popularizing the last word, a cocktail from at that point, nearly a hundred years ago, that people could fall in love with. And people did. People fell back in love with the last word so fast that it has now become, much like an old fashioned, sort of a recipe upon which to build other cocktails. There are countless variations of the last word, uh, proving that the equal parts spec is truthfully something that can be played with in a lot of different ways. And like an old fashioned where, yes, it does refer to a specific cocktail with specific ingredients, but it can also refer to a way to build a cocktail. There are different ways to construct it using the same methodology and produce a drink that is still palatable. It is one of the oldest cocktails to have survived not only prohibition, but also the dark ages of cocktails and come back in its original form to then be deliberated on again. It is noteworthy for every reason and a little ironic that it's called the last word when there's so much you can say about it. <laughs> That's really all you need to know, so let's go ahead and make ourselves a last word. Unfortunately, before we make a last word, we do have to have a bit of a sobering discussion on the nature 
of current worldly uh, import affairs. <laughs> you see, green chartreuse is one of two principal liqueurs in The Last Word alongside maraschino. And while maraschino is of Italian origin, green chartreuse is of French origin. Now, that isn't necessarily specifically important, but the thing is, it's still an import, and one for a botanical liqueur that is both incredibly complex, very difficult to make, and in a lot of cases is not made in large quantities, even back when it was easy to get prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Currently, green chartreuse is in such little supply as a result of leftover stocks of it being exhausted while it couldn't be made during quarantine times, that there's none to go around. For the most part, it seems that people overseas in Europe can get green chartreuse with a reasonable consistency. It's here in the US that it becomes a problem because import means expenses. And with such a limited supply in the first place, why would you spend the money shipping your product overseas when you can give it to people locally and they'll pay you the same amount? This is a long way of saying essentially that green chartreuse is pretty goddamn hard to find right now. And if you can find it, it's gonna be very expensive. There is a mega bev near me, which is like the northern equivalent of BevMo. They have it, but it's $68 a bottle. And yes, green chartreuse was always very expensive like that, but that is a price that I don't think is even justified by how good green chartreuse can be. That means we need to find an alternative. And I was very fortunate to go visit the people over at Tiffany's Wine and Spirits here in Kalamazoo and speak with them about a good alternative. And that is what is right here in front of me. This is uh, Gineppi, which is a, I believe, a different French a uh, company's distillate of botanicals, which is what green chartreuse is made out of, to produce a very, very similar product. Now, this isn't um, something that came out as a means of replacing green chartreuse while you could not get it. This has actually been around for quite some time, but it is remarkably similar to the palette and composition of green chartreuse with the caveat that it is inherently less intense, or complex even, actually. That's a better way to describe it. Giudeppe is made with a distillate of, I believe, 50 to 70 different botanicals, this sort of bouquet of a reasonable size, but green chartreuse is made with upwards of 100, and that additional complexity is definitely lost in this product. But the similarity of the flavors means that this will function as a reasonable stand-in, at least until green chartreuse comes back into a decent enough supply that we don't have to worry about fighting over the few bottles that are remaining. So that's our green chartreuse alternative. Are there others out there? Probably, but this is the one that I think comes closest to actually being green chartreuse without just decimating the profile of the cocktail by changing it too much. Okay, no talking, now we can make a cocktail. Time, let's go ahead and make ourselves a last word. This is a shaking cocktail, so we're going to take a cocktail shaker and combine equal parts of lime juice, maraschino liqueur, green chartreuse, and gin. Now the question actually does become, what kind of gin should you use? Because Plymouth gin is different from London Dry, and there are different kinds of London Dry because Hendrix exists and it's more esoteric and, and, and unique. Frankly, all of that is wrong. Uh, historically, a last word is made with bathtub gin, something that is actually continued at the DAC today where they make it using an infused vodka that includes herbs and spices and citrus and things and emulates a gin, but is not exactly a gin. <laughs> As a result, the best thing to go with for the sake of ease and not having to figure out how to make somebody else's incredibly complicated uh, liquor substitute, just use a London Dry. In this case, beef eater. <laughs> Speaking of beef eater, we're gonna start with one ounce of our London Dry one ounce of maraschino liqueur. In this particular case, I am using Luxardo, which is sort of the standard of maraschinos. Um, they're cherry flavored liqueurs, but not cherry, like sour cherry, like pucker. Something more along the lines of a like cherry peel, cherry pit, sort of leaning into a nutty kind of direction, cherry liqueur. And they're delicious and really complex and there is no substitute for it, just buy a maraschino. Next, we're gonna need one ounce of our green chartreuse or green chartreuse alternative, like Gin Epi. And finally, we need one ounce of freshly squeezed lime juice. In what world does a single lime not get you one ounce of lime juice? That is, that is insulting. What the hell? I think this came up in the last episode I did about the green tea gimlet, uh, specifically Greg Henry's. And I said that I could finally find large limes again. I can't anymore. So now I'm back down to this bullshit where I've got to squeeze two limes for a single ounce. Like, 
What the fuck is up with that? Anyway, one ounce of fresh lime juice. And that's all she wrote. Now all we have to do is add some ice to this and then shake to chill and dilute. As always, we are going to adhere to our one cube hole and one cube cracked ethos. We're gonna cap that up, tap it down, and then shake for 12 to 15 seconds to chill and dilute. Now, a last word is served up in a cocktail coupe, which I have a pretty appropriately themed sort of 1950s glass style one here. We're gonna double strain that to catch any ice or pulp. Pour that right on in. Now, technically speaking, garnishing a last word is optional. There is not a written permanent sort of garnish that goes into the drink. The original recipes do not include one. However, I think as sort of a modern touch, people have developed one, and one that I think is rather appropriate, uh, maraschino cherries. Now, uh, I'm holding in my hand the dreaded, disgusting Red Sunday maraschinos, and I don't want to put one in this cocktail, but I'm going to because there's a sort of affectionately pretty look about it to see the cherry in the drink, and there's a certain way that you garnish these that I think is so different from other cocktails. <laughs> ah, smells like death. In order to garnish a last word, you can take a maraschino cherry. We're going to get as much of the juice or syrup that it's stored in, depending on whatever kind you're using. Please use Luxardo's. They're very nice and appropriate for not only the time period, but also consumption reasons. We're gonna let that drain off a little bit. And then this goes directly into the cocktail. It sits at the bottom of the glass and provides a nice little splash of color at the bottom. Uh, that is entirely optional, but I thought would be fun, so I'm adhering to it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a last word, as you might find it at the DAC back then or today. Get back on there, you piece of shit. I gotta put you in the fridge so that I can throw you away later. Okay, so now that we've cleaned up our station just a little bit, let's go ahead and give this last word a taste. Salut. My God. <laughs> yes, my... Fucking God, that's so good. This has to be one of the best fucking things I've ever put in my mouth in my entire life. <laughs> so it's very, very much embracing the botanical notes of both the gin and the great chartreuse, or in this case, the Ginebi. And those combined create this really just bold and full bouquet of flavors that sort of take the gin and make it gin plus. Um, and additionally add some sweetness underneath those flavors that would otherwise make the drink very dry. That in combination with the astringency and the sourness of the lime juice, and then that additional sort of cherry, rich, dark, dark cherry note from the maraschino make the whole thing just this gorgeous, simple, cohesive, fucking perfect, cocktail. It's really hard to say that with, you know, most people would have a hard time saying that without cracking a smile because it's a really difficult concept. The idea of perfect is very subjective, but I don't think there's a case to be said for any cocktail coming so close to being everything you could possibly want out of a cocktail at one time. It is sweet from the liqueurs, but it is also herbal from specifically the green chartreuse and the gin, but it's also sort of fruity from both the, uh, the, the cherry notes of the maraschino and the lime, and then it's also sour, because that it's sour from that lime juice, and it's so bold and prominent, but just the right amount of restraint around the edges to keep it from being like acidic and, and bitter. It's, it, it's just, Awesome. And that's the thing, this is made with the London Dry too. I I, I, I have no idea what this would taste like with the, bath, the bathtub gin substitute they use at the Detroit Athletics Club. But my fucking God, if it's anything remotely like this, I don't think I would ever have another cocktail at that bar ever again uh, if I have a chance to go out there and try it. <laughs> it's, it's just a rolling complex. And the word I saw used by um, so I, I can't remember their name, but it was a famous bartender and bar owner said the, the word pungent. I think that's quite, quite appropriate. The flavors are very bold and rich, full bodied and forward. That's the, that's the thing. It's not that kind of, uh, you know, gentle back, back of the throat or er, herbalness or just the light cherry, cherry peel bitterness and cherry pit 
richness on the tip of your tongue. No, that is the body of the drink. It is capable of standing on its own and has done so through the test of time immemorial. And I, frankly, I, I, I wish I knew who actually made the drink because Frank Fogarty sure as shit didn't come up with something this amazing. If he did, I'll eat my words, but fuck me, that's good. That's gotta be from somebody who knows what they're doing and a vaudeville actor fucking doesn't. <laughs> it's, it's, it's both light and rich at the same time. It is herbal yet fruity. It is sour yet sweet. It is in perfect balance. You get everything you need to from every part of its ingredients and each one plays off of each other perfectly. It is wonderful. Truthfully. Truthfully, a perfect cocktail. And it makes sense, you know, tasting this now. You think about all the different variations of last words that have come out. There's one called uh, the Marvin's Last Word, which is uh, uh, from a Greek bartender. It has Mastaha in it. There's um, Last of the Wahikins, which uses mezcal instead of gin. I've heard that one is really, really good, too. Um, there's also one, um, oh, goodness. Uh, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it uses uh, lemon juice and yenever, I think, instead. There's a bunch of different people who've come up with specs for this that swap things out and they all work, but nothing I don't think is ever going to come as close to what this does, unless it gets even closer. And that's right, there is at least one, one last word variation that we are going to talk about this coming Tuesday by a bartender named Sam Ross, that while this is a, I would say that this is a perfect cocktail, their version is the perfect cocktail. So, if you enjoyed this video and like to hear me talk about the last word and all of its history, go ahead and click that like button and subscribe down below because next week we're going to do it again using a 2008 variation that I think just about anybody can get behind and is one of the most fascinating combinations of flavors I've ever had in my entire life. Go and follow my socials, they're appearing on the screen now. And hey, if you want to watch more videos, click those buttons that have been popping up in the top right corner of your screen. Those are my videos and I'm really proud of them and hopefully you guys can get some kind of enjoyment out of them as well. That's why I make them. Hopefully all of you get the chance to try this at home because even if the overhead on some of these liqueurs is really high, like actual green chartreuse is really expensive, maraschino liqueur and Luxardo especially, which is like, you know, the peak of the peak of maraschino liqueurs is pretty expensive. A nice gin, like a really nice gin in here, nothing wrong with that. It'd make it expensive. It's worth it. It is worth every penny that you can pour into it because the, the, with this made with the best quality stuff, oh man, perfect. With spring coming up no less too, this is like bright and refreshing and fascinating and good. And even people like my roommate who are not super invested in like classic upstyle cocktails and, and flavors like this, I mean, she got behind it. Like anybody can get behind this, I think. It is a perfect cocktail. Give it a shot at home. You're not going to regret it. Anyway, now I'm rambling. Thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed. Click the like and subscribe, all that good stuff I just said. And I'll see you guys in the next episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Until then, have a great rest of your day. Remember to drink responsibly. And I'll see you all around. Have a great day. Bye-bye.